Hey everyone, and welcome to the beginning of Series 3. We're really excited you're back. Yeah, thank you all for uh, joining us for this exciting series where you have a really special one here for you today and for the next couple of weeks. We are super excited about what we have moving forward for you. Um, and we also just wanted to take a minute to thank all of you for the responses that you have sent us on Twitter, uh, through email, um, uh, through the form on our website. We have loved hearing from you. A couple people have left reviews and it has, um, it has made us feel so good about sharing this with you and really, really excited about continuing to put out really great episodes. Yeah, every single review that we got in and every single message that we get and read on Twitter um, about your excitement for what we're doing here, it really fuels us and it makes us uh, understand that we're doing something that you enjoy. So please keep it up because seeing that little message just brings a, a nice spark of joy to our days. And uh, yeah, that can't be beat. We are really appreciative of all of the feedback that you have sent us, and we hope that you guys will keep it up, whether it is advice or ideas or constructive criticism. We are really looking forward to hearing from you and making this the best possible show that we can moving forward. So you'll notice that the format has changed slightly from uh, the previous series. Uh, we want to use this time to send out a little announcements to our fans and just give you a little bit of updates and uh, read out some reviews. Uh, so our updates for this week are, uh, we have a new web address. If you go to www.charactercreationcast.com, it will take you right to our current web page. We also want to let you guys know what our release schedule is going to be moving forward. Um, as much as we would really, really love to, we cannot put out six episodes every week. Um, so we are going to try to stick to something a little more manageable. So one part of the series will be released per week, and then one week off before a new series starts. So series 3.2 will be on April 23rd and 3.3 will release on April 30th. And then we will have a week off before we start another series. Yeah, we're trying to go with this schedule so that we don't get burned out by trying to release every single week at this point. Um, but we're going to try to get into the hang of things and, and see where things go. We also just don't want to overwhelm you by putting a bunch of podcasts in your feed all at once as much as we would really, really like to. Um, so instead of doing every other week, we're going to try this out. So we do have a few five-star reviews. Uh, we're going to go ahead and read one of those today. Uh, Amelia, you want to pull that up? Absolutely. So this is our very first review. So, you know, it's a special one. I'm going to frame it in my living room. We got a review from Not Another Nathan with the subject, Totally New Concept. So this is taking tabletop RPG talk in a whole new direction, and I can't wait to hear where it goes. The hosts are engaging and the flow works well. Add in great guests and high production value, and you have a great listen. Thank you so much, Nathan. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. That means the world to us. And with that, I will go ahead and start the series. We won't let you wait any longer because this is a very special one with Alex Roberts. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan. In this episode, my co-host Amelia and I welcome Alex Roberts, host of the Backstory Podcast on the One Shot Podcast Network. 
and creator of the game we are about to discuss and create characters for, Starcrossed, a romance role-playing game system kickstarting in April 2018, which is right now if you're listening as we release this episode. Alex, welcome to Character Creation Cast. We're really excited that you could sit down with us. Thank you so much for having me. This is very exciting. So can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and about some of the awesome stuff that you are involved in right now? Hmm, where to start? Uh, so I, I'm a game designer and um, I've created a couple of games, uh, digital and analog, um, but I also get to be involved in uh, role-playing game production. I, right now I'm working with Bully Pulpit Games. I've also worked with Pelgrane Press in the past. Uh, doing like production coordination and assistance. Uh, and that's really fun uh, to get to see like behind the magic. And I've also written for other people's games, which is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, Cause you just get to like swoop in, drop a v- bunch of ideas <laughs> and then swoop out. Yeah. Uh, so if, um, if you were one of the many backers of dialect, or if you want to pick up Threadbare, which I think is now available to everybody, uh, if you read Sig, the um, the city between, uh, I have little worlds and uh, and play sets and things like that in those. So yeah, so I get to do lots of fun things. And then in addition to having my cool podcast, where I invite all kinds of folks who may be designers or community organizers or scholars uh, to join me, and I, I do interviews with them, and it's very fun. Very nice. Well, thank you. Uh, and a quick note to our listeners, if what you hear on this episode intrigues you, uh, we will have a link to the Kickstarter for you in our show notes. Uh, and with that out of the way, why don't we make the best of your expertise, Alex, (laughs) and discuss what this game is all about. What's in a game? So let's start with the setting of Starcrossed. Um, do you play in any particular setting or is it kind of completely open to your imagination? So, uh... What unites every star-crossed story is that it's always about two people who really, really want to when they really, really shouldn't. Uh, and the way that that story goes is slightly constrained because there's a a set number of scenes that always have the same titles. So uh, the game comes with these little scene cards that have these kind of vague, like they're almost like chapter titles, an introduction or uh, a... A little misunder, a little embarrassment, uh, an argument becomes heated. So the way that people kind of take those and interpret those, and incorporate them into their story is always completely unique. But it means that the story structure is very similar and kind of tends to feel not formulaic, but uh, but there the underlying structure is the same. Okay. But the genre and the setting and the places that people go with this game absolutely all over the map. Uh, people have played out in fantasy, in science fiction. Uh, I've seen kind of like urban fantasy, like dark sort of vampires and werewolves type stuff. Uh, but then also I've seen like super everyday, like just absolutely kitchen sink, normal uh, fiction. Just basically what I'm taking a really long time to say is that it really 100% is completely open. Um, just about any setting you could think of, there's a way to tell a star-crossed story in it. So as you are playing the game, um, what are characters doing? We look at like D&D, they're adventuring, or in Masks, you're playing as superheroes. So like what, what does a character do in Starcross? In Starcross, your character falls in love. <laughs> <laughs> and then does nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they do lots about it. They dance all the way around it in every conceivable way. You do everything except act on your feelings. Um, it's a game of almosts and nearlies and words that are just kind of on the tip of your tongue. Um, <laughs> it's characters feel really, really strongly and then struggle to express that without expressing it all the way. It, there's a reason why it was developed under the name Tension. I feel like that's a really interesting concept, though, because almost every other role-playing game I've played, you say, in real life, there's this thing that I want to do that I, like, I would never be able to do. Mm-hmm. But then when you sit down at a table, you say, I can do all of these things, and no matter what this instinct is, I can act on it. 
in some capacity. So I feel like it's really interesting to have a game where the whole thing is that you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And uh, the the structure of the game really backs that up because uh, the the way that your character acts in this game is constrained by moves, which we can go through later when we're talking about the two different character sheets. Mm -hmm. um, but both characters, uh, they act in these really kind of specified ways. So just like the scene cards have these uh, really sort of uh, structure that it gives the game, um, the moves give structure to how your character acts. So there's really like, like six things that you do and then you just find endless ways to do them. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. And uh, I'm imagining that there is a very special piece of material that you need to actually <laughs> play this game. Um, could you go ahead and tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So you need 54 equally sized smooth rectangular bricks that you can stack in rows of three. Uh, there's like a brand name uh, of these that you can buy. It's called like Jomblo or like Jomblo, Jumbler Jumanji, or something like that. Yeah, um, so, so you could just like buy one. Um, <laughs> if you get, if you get the, the full uh, star-crossed set will come with its own beautiful tower made of this lovely maple wood. Ooh, ooh. Uh, but if you just want to back at the PDF level, then you're totally welcome to print it out and then beg, borrow, or steal uh, a, a tower of some other variety. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Like that you specified the number of bricks, so the one that I have in my closet that's missing a piece <laughs> is not acceptable. <laughs> you know what? I would say go for it and consider it like a hack. And then, All right. uh, yeah, tell me how it yeah, goes. This is, this is hard mode of this game. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I actually, um, I developed the alpha of this game with a tower that had like two missing bricks. So in a way, you're just playing like first edition Star Wars. Oh, yeah. It's like really classic. <laughs> yeah, like that, that really, Before really old cool. school stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So aside from the tower, is there anything else that you need? I didn't see like really dice or it's mostly based on those kind of moves with yeah. the tower. Yeah, you basically need uh, some character sheets, which come with the game, the rules, which come with the game, the tower, which comes with the game. Uh, there's no pencils. You will have to get some sort of writing device uh, so that you can write up your on your um, character sheets. Yeah, there's no dice. No other <laughs> weird, <laughs> weird my, stuff that you might My need. goal with Starcrossed is actually to make uh, Tumbling Towers the new dice, uh, such right. that that is like the only thing that, that RPGs use anymore. And people oh. are like, oh, if it doesn't have a tower, like, does that, does that count as a game? <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to see what you come up with next. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you say is the most unique thing about this game? Normally we just say what's unique, but it feels like there's a lot <laughs> that's different from other games. Well, what's funny is I I feel very strongly inspired by a lot of other games. Um, obviously, Dread was a huge influence on me. That's Epidia Ravichal's game uh, of of horror that uses the tower. So it's it really started as a hack of Dread before it um, morphed out of control into this beast that it is now. <laughs> Um, but really, the only way that I was able to evolve it beyond that was by playing so many other games um, that I could incorporate lots of other stuff beyond Dread. Um, Kagamatsu is one of my favorite games, so I kind of steal a little bit of that uh, constrained sense of action from there. Um, Hot Guys Making Out, very <laughs> influential on, on me, just kind of personally. Uh, in my life, <laughs> but but also on my design. Uh, really, the the lead follow mechanic that we'll talk about later um, is very influenced by the the two player version of Hot Guys Making Out uh, and the the dynamic, the sort of symm symmetrical move dynamic that uh, that Ben Lehman sets up in that game, um, breaking the ice, and really like all of Emily Carabas's work. Like in my opinion, just making romance games today like i don't know how that would be possible without the kind of groundbreaking work that she did so and, and then like even the the epilogue table is totally just like this sort of stolen and then modified and cutified <laughs> fiasco thing so i would consider this game to be a very unique mashup of a bunch of things that are not unique um <laughs> i i really like to honor my inspirations <laughs> Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't uh, don't reinvent the wheel, right? Yeah, exactly. 
there's so many cool games out there that could inspire you to make something cool. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's there's it's almost overwhelming like the number mm -hmm. of and it's still amazing that we find ways to do things differently after all of that that like right? you can have played all of those games and still come up with something totally different is like mind-boggling to me because I don't know that I like can do that mentally. That's <laughs> not the way my brain works. But <laughs> Like, more power to people that can. <laughs> you know, I thought that I would never make a lot, uh, like, a tabletop game. I thought, like, oh, no, I'm not really a designer. That's why I'll get into podcasting and write for other people and stuff. <laughs> I'll never make my own game. Um, and now I'm already working on my second one. So you never know when it will happen to you. <laughs> you started, and now you can't stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now I'm cursed. Wonderful. Um, well, now, before we get into the meat of the character creation, uh, we usually like to go over a few of the things that people might want to know uh, if they're following along at home. Uh, a little more information about the game itself, some terms, concepts uh, people might not be familiar with, etc. So normally, Alex, in this part, we talk about the history of the game and the system, but this game is super new, so it doesn't have, you know, 20 years of history behind it. So mm -hmm. really, I would like to hear about um, how this game came to be. You talked a little bit about being inspired by Dread, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about, like, start to finish, how did this happen? <laughs> Ooh, let's see, how long am I allowed to talk about this? <laughs> as long as you want. Okay, well, um, Let's. I'll try not to go into every single detail, but uh, let's see. The highlights are, let's see, maybe about five years ago, I played Dread, um, and it was one of the first RPGs that I really loved. And I thought, man, someone is going to write a playset for this that's just about falling in love, you know? And and the tower would represent like, you know, the the sort of like the the romantic tension of will they or won't they. I'm so excited for when that happens. And then I, I waited around for a while and no one else did that, uh, which was very displeasing to me personally. So I found out that I had to kind of do it myself. So it was an idea that I kicked around for a really long time. It would sort of like idly look at and idly play with. And I think eventually it just kind of had to be its own thing. And so I did a couple of alpha play tests with someone who I was seeing at the time where we were just playing a lot of two player games. Um, so it was very easy to get inspired by what I was playing. Um, and so basically we would just say like, okay, the tower, and we just start pulling and then trying to tell a story and be like, where does this catch? How does this work? Um, and then at some point I played hot guys making out and figured out a way to say, okay, if I really say one person does this and one person does this, and there's a kind of separation there there's a dynamic that automatically gets built in. If one person can do this and then rarely do that, and the other person can do that but rarely do this, like, bam, we already have a dynamic going. So yeah, so as I mentioned, playing all kinds of different games and then starting to play test it, starting to think about it a little bit, and then I decided to submit it to a convention called Metatopia, which is a playtest convention. So mm -hmm. instead of going and playing uh, your finished games and games that have been around for a while, people bring their games that they're still uh, working on that are in progress. It could be anywhere from like totally alpha, don't even know what to do with it, to like it's pretty much done and we're just tweaking this one thing. And it's the scariest thing I've ever done in my <laughs> life. <laughs> Uh, to put my game in front of strangers, uh, because at that point, it was a deck of handwritten index cards. And I did, I think, about like six playtests over the course of that weekend. Some of them scheduled, some of them not. And uh, each time I found that I had to like throw away and scribble on top of and write over uh, and rewrite a bunch of index cards. So at the end of the weekend, I had a different and much messier stack of index cards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that was version one. Um, so then I played with that for about a year. And, uh, and as I mentioned, I work for Bully Pulpit. So I'd just been kind of doing some admin, admin work and some marketing and stuff for them. And we kept having these meetings where they were saying, you know, it'd be interesting to, uh, to publish someone else's game, like most, mostly... Um, uh, they published Jason Morningstar's games because it's Jason Morningstar and Steve Sig uh, Sigetti. Mm -hmm. um, but they also published the Warren 
um, which is Brennan Reese's game a few years ago. And they're like, oh yeah, we should do that again. Oh, you know, it'd have to be like the right system. It'd have to be the right person who we had a really good re- working relationship with. I don't know who like, Do I say what. something? Do I say something? Do well, I do I, it? It literally took like three meetings for me to even think about it and then be like, oh yeah, hey guys, I've been working on this game. Like, do you want to see it? I don't know if it's any good or anything. I, I was kind of just thinking it would like, <laughs> like don't feel you know, like you have to, but if you want to just look at it, yeah, like have a lunch. I was very much in that <laughs> mode, which like, I don't do anymore. I'm totally, I'm trying my best to get over that. But it's, anyway, it's that, hard. It's, it's I'm so... like that too, though. Like, don't, you know what? It's felt like I don't want to inconvenience you. Like, right. no, have the courage of your convictions. Yeah. I think maybe three or four games from now, I'll be able to just like kick down the door and be like, check this out. I'm here. Um, <laughs> but I'm not there. <laughs> and I, I wasn't steps. there then. I was very much like, okay, well, take a look at this, but I don't know. And they were like, hey, this has legs. Uh, so I continued to play test it and got some opinions from other people in front of them and they're like okay yeah let's move on this so i signed a contract in uh november and then exploded nice uh and then when i was uh, done doing that <laughs> i kind of got to work and being like okay well this has to be really 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 good you know if this was just a pdf that i kind of threw up into the world uh, and tossed in front of my friends it i would it would have to be good but now it has to be really good and oh my god it's really good now it's really good now like i i really actually feel very confident in saying that yeah it's no it's really good you're and, right I'm, oh i haven't gosh. played it yet but like reading it it's it's really mm-hmm. good yeah and <laughs> i heard uh, the, i heard the appearance on she's a super geek and <gasps> that was just remarkable even though it was just an audio medium the tension of the the oh polls and the sounds that people were making was just so intense i loved yeah. it well, oh my gosh, like Phil and Senda, if you're listening, you brought everything to that game and really, really showed off what it can do. They have such a beautiful dynamic and it that that would that's a really, really good run. Um, but I can tell you it wasn't a totally weird, unusual run either. Like that is how that game plays. That is what that brings out in people. Mm-hmm. And every time that I've play tested it, like just seeing like making games can be hard sometimes you know and when you're just working and revising and rewriting like you can feel feel kind of down sometimes but man every time i see people play and i see them giggle and you know like get tense and shake and uh and and get to know each other you know when i see strangers play this game with each other and at the end of it they're like they're friends and they hug like it's so cool (laughs) and that is what has kept me going. I have to say, if if someone is listening and they're working on a game, like it's scary to play test, but just get it in front of some people because, like, I don't know how you have the strength to go on otherwise. If you don't see, <laughs> if you don't see what your game can do to people, it's like, um, it's like when you tell a really good joke and it lands and you make people laugh. Mm-hmm. It's it's just a great feeling. Yeah, that feedback finally after like forever looking at it yourself and like putting stuff out into the world is always really really scary like yeah, that's i is. mean a reality for i think anybody who makes anything that mm-hmm. it, no matter how many times you do it there's always a moment of like hesitation and anxiety about it but i think that the only reason that you do it is for that feedback whether it's i mean not always good but yeah. um you know especially when it really does land i'm sure that that's like a euphoria mm-hmm. <laughs> yes yeah absolutely can I, I want to ask one more question. I know we've talked about it for a little while and That's like, okay. don't beat me up, Ryan, but <laughs> I want to ask, like, at what point did you decide that this was its own game and not just a hack of another game? So that's, that was actually very difficult for me to distinguish because I feel really strongly that games that are hacks of other games, like that's not less than, uh, than any other way of making a game. It's an awesome way to make a game. It's, it's, mm-hmm brilliant it's smart and i love games that are variations on a theme whether it's a like a forged in the dark kind of blades in the dark hack or uh i mean some of my favorite games are apocalypse world hacks right like Mm -hmm. monster hearts i mean talk about a game that has influenced me monster hearts is is a huge 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 influence on me and that's an apocalypse world hack um so I didn't want to, I I kept thinking of it as a dread hack until like super recently. And it actually took uh, Jason Morningstar talking to me about it. And the way he phrased it was, 
not everybody who likes dread is gonna like your game and it's to, like it's misleading to people to say oh yeah this is like dread but mm -hmm. um because because there's kind of all this other mechanical stuff happening that is very different mm. so i kind of I only started making that differentiation really recently. Um, and it's actually out of respect for Dread to say like, <laughs> hey, <laughs> just because you love Dread doesn't mean you're going to love this. And Heavily inspired by, but not directly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. So I love to cite it in the way that I love to cite all of my inspirations. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is, even if you didn't like Dread, if it, if it wasn't your thing at all, um, you will like it. Because I've also heard that feedback from people that they were like, oh, I thought I might like it because... I wasn't a huge Dread fan, but there was actually something here for me. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So the, the next part of this is before we really jump into making our characters, mm -hmm. um, what terms and stuff do people need to know? Like, what are things that we have to let everybody know about so that they don't have to read the full rule book while they're listening to us make our characters? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I think... Let's see, the terms that we really talk about when we are character creating that, uh, that are specific to the system, um, one of them is definitely moves, right? So like I said, uh, characters act, well, really players act in very specific set constrained ways in playing this game. It's part of the fun. Uh, you, uh, you savor not being able to do everything that you want to do. It's the name of the game. <laughs> um, so when we talk about moves, I mean that I mean the ways that your character interacts with the fiction and what you can kind of do on your turn, right? On your turn, you do a move and then you pass it over to your your partner in play. Um, so that that will become a little bit clearer, but just so you know, a move it's not like an apocalypse world move or like a I don't know putting the moves on somebody it's kind of a specific <laughs> term in this game uh the other term that may come up is scenes so like i talk like i i spoke about earlier um the the game is a series of up to eight scenes the tower may fall before the eighth one uh but it's it's never more than eight and they're kind of set one of the ways that i'm very excited to see if people hack this game and i shouldn't give it away because i want to see if people just come up with it really um, is it if they switch the order of the scenes? I want people to write their own scenes. Oh. So if you wrote a different set of scenes, but still played the same game, how would it, what would that look like? Oh, that would be really cool. I know. <laughs> and I love that I can just assume that people will hack my game. It's funny <laughs> because I was reading through the rules and I kind of thought the exact same thing. Yes, awesome. <laughs> I was See, like, there are oh, people are, that are game are, designers are, and then the people that are like, ooh, like I'm much more of a narrative player of like, mm -hmm. oh, what can I do? You know, like, there are people that are like the designer side of it that are like, oh, how can I fix this? <laughs> yeah. it, it wasn't even a matter of fixing. It was like, uh, well, these are really interesting. And I wonder if you change some of these scenes, if it would change the game. Like, I, I would love to see a different set of eight scenes. Mm -hmm. um, or, I mean, presumably they could be a different number. Um, I feel like it'd be really hard to tell how different it is just because no, there's no control set in this game. Like there's no, this is what this <laughs> game looks like when you play it. Mm -hmm. So to know whether it really like has a huge effect or not, I feel like it would be really hard. You'd have to play it a bunch of times. So the only, like so, be like you and have seen people play it, you know, it, countless so, times. So many times. <laughs> uh, yeah. So when I say scenes, I mean, um, basically the uh the first scene is an introduction and the two players go back and forth doing moves and they will continue to just go back and forth doing moves until uh the player who is the follow right so in this game there's the lead and the follow and we'll talk about that later uh so the follow can at any time say okay cool that's a good place to end let's end on that note uh whether it's at the end of their turn or at the end of the lead's turn um, and once that happens, then the two players decide, okay, what does the next scene look like? They turn over the next scene card and they go from there. Uh, so when I say scene, I mean that there's eight of them and it kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to define a scene. It's, it's just a continuous span of fictional time, uh, with little breaks in between. Yeah. <laughs> just like in a movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're kind of like, uh, like scenes in a movie are like chapters in a book. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and, uh, this game uses an X card. So if people aren't familiar with the X card, it's a tool that can be used in a game 
uh, you can add it to almost any game. It, it, it works really well. Um, but this game, I've actually included it with the base set. Like it, it comes with a card with a big X on it and oh, it's wonderful. explained in the rules. Um, yeah, I like that that encourages you to to utilize it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that it's not a thing that you have to put in there and be like, okay, just so you know, here. It's like, no, this is, please, it's there. That's <laughs> what it's for. It's mm-hmm. there if you need it. You just put it on the table. You can. You don't have to touch it if you don't want to. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, this game comes with an X card uh, just because it involves um, coming up with stuff together, right? And coming up with stuff that is about a relationship that is forbidden. Mm-hmm. And sometimes relationships are forbidden but sometimes they're like oh forbidden like no i forbid that because it's bad and i don't want it um (laughs) and you and your co-player have to be on the same page about like what's enticingly forbidden and what's just kind of like oh good job forbidding that because it should remain in the forbidden state and not Mm -hmm. allowed um uh because you want to get uh enticing and not gross so uh so the x card is just there to say let's keep it exciting for everyone like maximally amazingly exciting right you are you this is a two-player game you have exactly two people to please in this case we're going to have an audience so it's a little bit different but (laughs) generally speaking you have exactly two people so why not play a game and incorporate elements and have characters and plots that are just amazingly incredibly exciting like that just absolutely set your heart on fire why have anything less? So the X card is there to just be a tool that you can just tap and say, that is less than amazing. We can use our words. I think our words are like super good tools to do lots of things. But sometimes, you know, in a sentence when you say, no, seriously, mm-hmm. this is like the, the physical version of no, seriously, let's not. <laughs> I like that the understanding around the X card, um, I've I've mostly only seen them in convention games mm-hmm. um, because the, the people that I tend to play with, it's like a smaller group and we, you know, know each other pretty well. And But I also know that if I ever said anything, it would be fine. Mm-hmm. But in those situations where you are dealing with kind of, um, I don't want to say uncomfortable because that's not really the right word, but like, yeah. you know, it's sort of tense and like heavy topics or you're playing with people that you don't know particularly well or anything like that. It's nice to have the option to say, no mm-hmm. and to know that everybody else at the table will respect that and that yeah. you don't have to explain it mm-hmm. i think it, which yes. is the best part about it is that there's no nobody follows up and says why it's the understanding is okay we're done yep that's you know like yeah. we will move on to the next scene or we will you know stop or whatever but you don't have to explain why yeah exactly and it could be any element of play right whether it's like oh, that thing that you just incorporated about your character kind of reminds me of this person I don't feel great about. So I'm just going to tap the X card and we'll remove that element. Or it could be like, oh, you don't you don't know that I have a phobia of spiders. So like this whole like cute thing where your character is like afraid of spiders. Oh, that's not going to be cute to me. It's just going to make me think about a thing that really scares me. <laughs> right. So it can be all kinds of stuff that you're just like, no, boop, X. You just tap the X and it goes away. Yes. It's pretty cool. It's like a backspace, but for fictional worlds. Ooh. <laughs> so anyway, it's a it's a good fit for this game, so that's why I decided to include it. Yeah, and it's a, I mean it's a valuable tool for any game, but I, I like that you put it in there to begin with. So it's not something like I said that you have to consciously think about and add, or that you get to a point where you're playing the game and you're like, oh no, I wish I had it right now. So it's like already <laughs> there and thought that, like I like that you did that work for us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, so with all of those things out of the way, we are going to make some people. Yes, let's make some people. Cool. Let's make some people. Uh, so why don't I guide the two of you through uh, character creation? Perfect. Yes, please. So the first thing that you do in character creation is make a world. Just like that, super easy. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so in, in some uh, systems... A, you have a, this cool, interesting world that is already present for you. In some systems, you design a world and come up with it together, and then maybe you can kind of put some characters in there and figure out how they fit into it. But I, I think in Starcrossed, it's so hard to separate the characters from the world that they're in because they're both just elements 
of the story that is this relationship, right? So what we're really going to do is ask ourselves two questions. Um, what has brought these two together and what is keeping them apart? So you need to come up with a reason why two people would be in relatively close quarters for an extended period of time without really like an option to not see each other anymore um, or it's to, to just bail and not interact. Because uh, if there's an easy out, then there's no game, right? right. It's kind of like that in <laughs> horror fiction too. <laughs> um, so you come up with a reason why two people are interacting a lot, but then you come up with a reason why they can't get as close as they want to be. Or they can't have, I should say, the kind of relationship that they want to have. All For right, example. So Ryan, or, oh, go ahead. Oh my gosh, do you have ideas already? I, 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 I do. I was That's gonna say so- Ryan probably does because this is how his brain works. <laughs> is that he's like he thought this through like four days ago. <laughs> well, it was well, yesterday, but still. He- okay, <laughs> toss him out. Let's let's hear some ideas. All right. So oh, one of my passions is the magical girl genre. Okay. Good. Relatable. So, yes. So I wanted to, at the very least, um, with one of these sets of characters that we're making. Yes, we're making multiple. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do it. <laughs> I wanted to do a magical girl themed pairing. pairing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm open to this. However, please be aware. I'm super unfamiliar. Yes. <laughs> with the, I'm aware of the concept of a magical girl genre. However. How is your magical girl knowledge, Alex? So here's the thing. I, I don't have a breadth of knowledge. I have a depth of knowledge oh. uh, in the, in the, um, that kind of knowledge sphere. Uh, I am really, 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 really into Sailor Moon. Oh, okay. Well, that's what you and Ryan are doing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. because I'll, in our I'll, last game, he literally let's, recreated let's on Sailor Neptune. Yeah. Um, so my, yeah. yeah, the last recording, I recreated Sailor Neptune in feudal Japan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that works. Like, I can just picture that so easily. It was so Okay, fun. cool. It was so cool. We, will, we will do a Sailor Moon one then. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, Amelia, what are some genres that really like speak to you? Like when you uh, when you reach to fiction, wh- what draws you in? Ooh, I am much more in the fantasy sci-fi sort of cool, cool. like fictional genres. So um, I love Harry Potter. I love Star Wars. Mm-hmm. I love <laughs> like all of those sort of. So like I feel like I would really like to do some sort of like modern magical setting okay rad yeah um do you want to do wizard school like let's do wizard school do you want to do wizard school um let's just say that we're gonna you know what and have the courage of my convictions (laughs) (laughs) that's it executively decided uh ryan do you think that there's meat on that bone oh most definitely yes um and i am 100 percent game for anything so i'm all in Okay, cool. Right. Well, let's try to think of a of a hmm. So, um, so let's think about the dynamic that might exist there. Um, some some forbidden relationships that might take place uh, in a in a sort of Harry Potterish way. So, like in the past, um, this game has had everything from like uh, I I did this like professional wrestling one, <laughs> nice. um, where it was like the heel and the baby face, and they had all this like chemistry in the ring and they didn't want to ruin it with you know out of the ring um, <laughs> entanglements that's so good um so that like that's one that's kind of like not a genre exactly it's just kind of a story mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. i would say wrestling is a genre <laughs> it is now thanks nathan de paletta <laughs> world red wrestling will now have to be added to the yes. uh, to the list <laughs> i i think that i'm a big fan of the um a healthy competition dynamic. Oh, so like you're people. from different houses? Like you're like a Slytherin and a... Yeah, uh, or I mean, even the same house and both trying to be top of the class or, you know, just sort of like, I think that competition leads to a healthy amount of tension. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll we'll come up with a reason. So I, I think that there's a really, really good dynamic there. Ryan, thoughts? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, Especially if we're just... If we're students trying to get to the top of the the class and um, 
trying to to win the favors of the teachers and stuff like that um and constantly trying to one up each other i think there's a lot of uh, uh especially if we're forced to work together on mm-hmm. different projects because we're both at the top like mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. There, it's a difference of who's at the top top but we're both <laughs> clearly above everybody yeah. else so the teachers always throw us together on the special projects okay cool um, this is lovely, and I really like that we can have this kind of like um, chaste teen like romance. That's just like, <laughs> really like cute. One thing about Starcrossed is that uh, I have had some like very steamy games. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness! And especially when there's like external playtesting, and I just hear about it later, oh. um, I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, but it can also tell these like really adorable stories that are uh, very sweet um, and don't necessarily have that kind of like sexual tension going on, um, but are just about like two people who want to hold hands, but they can't hold hands because of other things in their mm-hmm. lives. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm cool with, uh, with playing at this like teen romance. That's very cute. I like it. I'm for it. <laughs> Rad. Awesome. Um, okay, sweet. All right. So why are they together? They go to the same magical school. Mm-hmm. Why are they apart? Because they're rivals and they could never give in. <laughs> it, mm-hmm. it would ruin their image in the school as well. I mean, they're they're <laughs> constantly vying to outdo each other. And if they, you know, give in and, and are seen as that sort of couple, mm-hmm. it, it instantly kind of ruins their uh, their cred, I guess. Right. I think, right. yeah, it becomes about them being a couple and not about... Them being the, important the best things. Yes. They're s- that's great. They're so egotistical that they can't even be a power couple. They're like, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, and I think that they've probably spent so much time talking crap about the other person to their friends, too, that, like, you can't take that back. Mm-hmm. Oh, can't. yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It, oh, man. Like, that's you can't, so good. It, like, I'm not going to be the one to admit that mm-hmm. to them. <laughs> Yeah, because then you would be proving yourself wrong, and we're never wrong. I'm never wrong. Exactly. <laughs> Yes, correct. This is good. This is really good. (laughs) Okay, beautiful. Okay, lovely. So I have character sheets in front of me right now. Mm -hmm. And what's lovely is in order to make characters, we really just kind of go down the line and answer these questions with one little quirk that we'll get to when we get to that question. Mm -hmm. Um, So the one at the top is who am I? So, oh, hey, you know what we should do before this? We should decide. Who is the lead and who is the follow? So in this game, there are two roles, neither of which has more power than the other. They play in complementary um, fashions that are symmetrical but not identical. So this was really inspired by um, what I got from learning swing dance. I'm like super, super into swing dance. Nice. Um, All right. Yeah. And... Uh, I, when I started learning swing dance, I learned to follow and I discovered that I was really good at it. And I discovered that, oh, hey, like picking up on what's happening and doing things in a receptive and attentive fashion is like a valuable way to contribute to a dynamic, not just like a a passive thing that I'm just like passively. Thank you. Yes. It is actually, it's actually work and it's labor and it's not just like (laughs) something that just passively happens. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So that was really cool. And then the more that I learned about leading, I was like, oh, wow, when you lead, you have to do these totally different things um, where you're introducing stuff and then seeing how things are going. And there's a different kind of awareness um, that you have to maintain. Um, So I thought that's a really interesting dynamic. And I wanted to see if I could translate it to an RPG. So the most important thing to know when we're deciding who is lead and who is follow is that the lead does the first move in the scene. So the first turn belongs to them. You both set the scene together. You decide what's happening in the scene before the first move happens. Um, But the first move belongs to the lead, which some people find really exciting. Other people find really intimidating and they hate it. Um, And what's great is that the follow ends the scene. So the follow is... If they were the director, they would say cut, right? The follow says, that's great. Let's end the scene there. Which again, some people love having that power and some people are really intimidated by it. But it's sort of like 
do you want to get the first word or the last word in the conversation? <laughs> yeah. But there's also a little asymmetry of moves. So when you act on your turn, you can either describe your character's movements, describe a detail in the character's environment, describe your character touching the other character, or describe your character revealing something personal. And where the lead and the follow differ is that the lead can do those last two things intentionally, every, like once per scene. They can do it relatively frequently, but they can only do so unintentionally once per game. And for the follow, it's reversed. They can do uh, that touching the other character or revealing something personal unintentionally once per scene, so pretty frequently, but only intentionally once per game. So in other words, the lead is doing things that, are, that make their intentions very obvious, right? They're doing things that are direct, right? If the lead is going to touch you on the shoulder, the lead is going to reach over right in front of your face and place their hand on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. And you'll mm -hmm. go, okay, well, I know what they were trying to do and they did it. As where it would be very rare for them to just have this sort of slight brushing of the hand against yours. And you get to wonder, oh, did did they mean to do that? Or did they just kind of like accidentally bump into me? Oh my, I don't know. <laughs> um, as where the follow is all about that. The follow is all about, you know, just um, just reaching to grab something behind you and their hand brushes against yours or uh, stumbling slightly so that they just uh, bump into you. All these kind of um, really cute flirtatious things. <laughs> but they can only <laughs> act with that really, really clear intention once per game. Uh, and so, in other words, it's a very dramatic moment when the follow acts intentionally. And it is such a dramatic moment when the lead, for example, reveals something personal accidentally when they kind of let something slip. is always a good moment every game. I love it. So, yeah, so that's what makes them different. Um, so we're not going to play today. No. Um, but if we were, that is what that is what the differences would be. Okay. I feel um, like it still kind of informs a little bit about yeah I, I the person. Still kind of want to talk about yeah. That. I want to know what do you think, Ryan? Do you have an instinct that says my instinct says follow? Okay. If you're good with, I kind of like am waffling back and forth between what I feel like would be more fun to try out. Mm -hmm. So I I am fine with saying I will be the lead. Great. If you cool. want to be the follow, sure. Cool. I'm cool with being like incredibly bossy and <laughs> <laughs> but so that it is so unable to reveal something to uh to do something right. subtle and delicate yes <laughs> <laughs> unable to conceal your intentions uh that's great so uh you grab the lead sheet and you would grab the follow sheet mm -hmm. and we will go down the line so who am i um so in this in this system you may not even have a name because very often there is like a clear dynamic of like you're the commanding officer and I'm the private. Uh, you are the captain of this pirate ship and I am the uh, cabin boy. Um, you are whatever it is. So um, ironically, the sheets that I have in front of me, I'm realizing are from two different games. So I have a lead sheet for... A vampire and uh, th the follow in that particular game was a werewolf and I have a follow sheet that where the answer to the name who am I to the to the question who am I is the baby face um, <laughs> because the lead in this case the, this case was the heel so that gives you a little sense of what usually goes <laughs> under uh, who am I I kind of like the idea of one of you being like the Gryffindor and one of you being the Slytherin, but I actually don't know enough about Harry Potter to know if that makes sense. And I don't know if you want to play literally Harry Potter or just like generic imaginary wizard school. So my gut is generic imaginary wizard mm -hmm. school only because I refuse to be anything except a Ravenclaw because <laughs> that's who I am. <laughs> so like hardcore nerd school. I love, that's... I love that that is a that that is a core part of your identity that's um well, and i love that you won't compromise on what's important to you i respect that you know, a lot amelia like we all need to have our values and our you know like this is where <laughs> i draw the line alex okay <laughs> and I, I would say i'm a gryffindor but i'm probably a hufflepuff so that's, that's okay doesn't that make you like the most gryffindor of all though no wait i'm thinking of something no else. i think you are the most gryffindor if 
you are definitely not a Gryffindor, but you say that you are. <laughs> I think that's how that works. <laughs> no, I think I want to do like generic, yeah, magical. Okay, cool. Are you in different houses or the same house? I don't know. What do you think, Ryan? I would say the same house because there can only be one top of the house. It's true. Oh, okay, there's like a first. So like otherwise, yeah, because you could, we could each be like top in our own house, but we need to be top. Top. Yeah, it's like the first seat in an orchestra that we're trying to go for, or something like that, but it's the first seat of the wizarding house. Sure, yeah, right. we could say that there's a position like chair mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, you get, you get a lot of power uh, with that seat and a lot of uh, recognition within the wizarding community, and it really looks good on your wizarding college resume. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those applications are brutal. They really it's are. It's politics. Seriously. Oh, Can't even man. use magic to fill them out. <laughs> it's true. They're like ballpoint pen only. Seriously. <laughs> Prove your worth. Can't even use a quill. <laughs> so I I want to say that I, as the lead, am the one that's like already, like I'm currently winning this competition. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is. Sure. It, I su Like I would say like I'm the current valedictorian. Okay. Yes. That's great. All right. And I am on your heels. <laughs> so uh, under Who Am I, you can put a name if you want, if you think you might use it. Um, I also find that like if people need them, they kind of come up with them on the spot during the game. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just fill in with your role however you would kind of summarize it. Yeah, I'm just going to write the valedictorian. Love it. All right. So then do we, do we want to run down yeah. so all of my questions first, or do we want to go back and forth? We between... do it together, and I will okay. show you why. So right. the next question is, what is my most attractive feature? So that means when your character thinks about themselves, when they, you know, whether it's physical or mental or emotional, it's anything about their being that they think, yeah, you know what? That's what I really got going on. That's one thing about myself I think is really, really attractive. It could be anything. All right. I get, so, I get mine. Okay. Oh, really? What, what, what's yours? Um, I went with uh, eyes. They're kind of like this uh, green with a little bit of multicolorness uh, kind of speckled throughout. Oh, do they kind of like, do they kind of like change a little bit on different days? Uh, different lighting, I guess oh. you could say. And mm -hmm. like sometimes the, the gold in his eye will catch the light in a certain way. Sometimes it's a little bit of a purple, sometimes mm -hmm. a little bit of a blue, but the green's always there. So this is an example of a really, really good uh, trait because uh, we're going to come up with these and the idea is that you would be able to incorporate these into scenes. So when you're describing your character's movements or little details or things about how your character is acting, you, you now have something to hold on to, right? And be like, you know, because in the dim light, his eyes look almost silver as, you know, he whatever, whatever's. And uh, so, yeah, good, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Amelia? So I wrote down perseverance. Mm, okay, cool. That's awesome. So now you have something that your character can do and just like absolutely hold on to and just be this like dog with a bone, like not giving it up no matter what. And you get mm -hmm. to play really true to your character. Yes. Now, the next question on the sheet is what are two things about me that I don't realize are attractive? So this is not something that your character would think of, right? If they were, say, you know, filling out their magical OK Cupid or whatever. <laughs> but they're things that the other character finds it attractive. So what we do is we swap character sheets. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I don't know how you want to do that digitally. I didn't really think it through. I'm filling out mm. uh, the leads character sheet for that question right now. Oh. Oh, are you guys in a shared Google Doc right now? Are oh, you at the end of the I'm thing? Not. I am not. I started my own Google Doc. <laughs> you should just, can you, can you just send me like a link in the group chat? Yes. Cool. Okay. Do you have a lead and the follow in the same sheet? Yes, I do. Okay, because then I'll just type my stuff in in my spot. Okay. Oh, but that's really important. Um, that there's not like a secret thing, you know, in this game. I mm -hmm. think transparency really helps this particular design. So totally share with each other ideas for things that could be um, answers. Mm -hmm. Um, it it only adds right. All right. So I'll, I'll give you a moment to write down those things about the other character, and then we'll do a reveal and I'll get to hear about them, which is very exciting. <laughs> All 
Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is an independent production and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time.